underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Apartment Gurus, where we dive deep into all things multifamily investing. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower real estate investors to reach their highest potential. Each week, host Tate Seymour and co-host Chelsea Garber interview high-level guests from all over the industry who are sure to bring valuable, actionable ideas that will propel your business to the next level. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned investor, you are in the right place. And now your hosts, the apartment gurus, Tate Seymour and Chelsea Garber. Welcome everybody back to another episode of the apartment gurus. And I am solo today without my co-host Chelsea Garber. And I'm very excited to have uh, Mr. John Kasman on the show. John, welcome. Uh, we're going to get into some really valuable stuff for the listeners. I'm really glad to have you. Hey, Tate, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here as well. Tell Chelsea she missed it. Yeah, uh, well, but, <laughs> but I'm excited yeah. to have you here and uh, great to talk to you. Yeah. So a little bit about John. John is a real estate entrepreneur who has partnered with busy professionals to invest in over $100 million worth of apartments. John also consults active multifamily investors to help them start or grow their business. And he's the host of the incredible Multifamily Insights podcast, which was called, formerly called the Target Market Insights. And he's the co-creator of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, John. Uh, and then prior to becoming a full-time investor, John worked in the corporate world overseeing market marketing campaigns for General Motors, Nike, and Coors Light. So I got to ask you, John, before we dive in, what do you like to do for fun? Man, for fun. So uh, definitely not analyze deals. Uh, that yeah. is not the thing I like to do for fun. Uh, you know, I've got two boys and they're pretty active. You know, they're, yeah. they're eight and five, I'll be eight and six. So uh, they're pretty active. So a lot of my free time is with them. You know, they're very athletic. They love sports. My older son just loves anything that is competitive. So we were playing tennis. I told him I had never picked up a tennis racket <laughs> before. <laughs> so he had me out there playing tennis with him, but I'll take him to the golf driving range, nice. uh, shoot hoops, we'll throw the football around, baseball, all that kind of stuff. Chess, you know, just again, it doesn't have to be sports, but chess cards uno anything competitive uh they they get riled up so i love spending time with them yeah. and uh, outside of that you know really just trying to spend time with friends and family i mean ultimately yeah. that's what we try to do is connect with our loved ones yeah. and uh, have the time to do that so i like to do those things yeah those boys those two ages will keep you very very busy i know that so and then where are you joining us from today yeah i'm in cincinnati ohio wow oh, that's my hometown is where it? I'm well, from. Look yeah. at that. Look at yep. that. I grew up there and uh, went to high school there and then went to Ohio University for college. So, okay. What yeah. part of Cincinnati did you grow up in? Anderson Township. Okay. No, well, yep. awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, well, that's cool. Uh, cool connection there. And, uh, and yeah, go Bengals, right? Yeah, they're doing great. So I'm from yeah. Cleveland originally. Okay. My wife is from Cincy and it's okay. one of those things where uh, we moved here. We were in Chicago together for eight years and then moved here to Cincinnati. But the Bengals have been great. The city is just yeah. thriving. And yeah. I will tell you, the thing I love about this city is, one, the weather is not as bad. I grew up in Cleveland. I live in Cleveland, yeah. Detroit, and Chicago. So our winters were brutal. Yeah. And it may not sound like it unless you know the Midwest, but Cincinnati has a very mild winter in comparison to those cities. Yeah, so, got, I mean, I, I didn't have to shovel the snow like, you know, the first year, the second year. I thought we had a heated driveway. 
<laughs> because the snow just always melted before I got to it. And I realized, yeah. oh no, it's not, it's not heated. I just, uh, you know, it just didn't accumulate quite as well. So, uh, but it's nice. I like it. Get all four seasons. It's really accessible to the rest of the country from a yeah. logistics standpoint. We've got a lot of great jobs going. I've obviously put on my Cincinnati uh, broker's cap at this point, right? So I'm not yeah. selling you on the city of Cincy, uh, <laughs> but we like living here. It's a great place to raise a family for sure. So we're, we're happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah. I get back there all the time. Uh, we, we own property in Columbus two hours North. So I'll often just fly direct into Cincinnati and, and drive up to Columbus, see my family in Cincinnati and on the, on the uh, way in way out kind of thing. So, uh, awesome. John, well, if you would just share with the listeners a little bit about you and your, your kind of your backstory and how you got to what you're doing today, and then a little bit about what you do do today. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned in my bio, we've helped other investors invest in over a hundred million dollars worth of apartments. And we work with regular everyday people. You know, if you've got a W2 job, you're making pretty good money, but you're looking to invest and you want to be in real estate, but you don't want the hassles of being a landlord or a flipper, you know, you can invest with groups like mine. So that's what we've done uh, or that's what we do. How we got here is pretty interesting. So you were winding that clock back. You mentioned I was in corporate America doing marketing for big brands. One of the first brands that I worked for was when I worked at General Motors on the client side. I worked on the Pontiac business. And going back to 2007, 2008, you may remember that the economy started to suffer a little bit and we went into a recession. Uh, General Motors actually had to file for bankruptcy. We closed the Pontiac brand and I ended up emerging on the Buick team and working a little bit on the GMC team. And part of what happened for me is I watched my peers, my colleagues, people who were lifers, who did everything they tell you to do, go to job, go to school, get a good job, work that job until you retire. I mean, here I am in corporate, you know, I'm at headquarters of General Motors. I'm running national advertising campaigns. I've got a hundred million dollar advertising budget. And I, you know, I have a job that quite frankly, many people would be envious of. I was going to the Super Bowl. I was going to the final four. I was hanging out at, you know, Maxim Hot 100 parties as a single guy. You know, this is a fun lifestyle at this time. It still works, still corporate America and all that stuff. But if you're going to work in corporate, it's not a bad gig to be able to go to the Super Bowl and do all these fun things. Right. What really happened for me, though, is when we went through bankruptcy and I watched how it impacted a lot of my peers. You know, folks lost their jobs who had no plan B. There was no backup plan. There was no you know, nothing else kind of lined up. And I saw the anxiety it created for those people. Now, at the time I was in my, you know, my early to mid twenties. So I wasn't as worried about retirement or getting another job, but I also saw how it impacted the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. When I went to apply for other jobs, mm -hmm. nobody was hiring. You know, you could not get a job in Detroit in marketing in probably most fields, but I couldn't get a job. Nobody was hiring at that time because everyone was going through the same thing. Yeah. So I thought back to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I read coming out of college. And all of those lessons, just they made so much sense. And the practicality of them came rushing back. And at that moment, I made it a point to start investing in real estate. The only challenge is I was still living in Detroit. This is 2009, 2010 now. And the Detroit real estate market was not the place to invest in. Well, you could take that one of two ways. It was actually a great right. time to invest if you knew what you were doing. Yeah. But everybody I knew who owned real estate, they were running for the hills. They were trying to fire sell their properties. And I certainly didn't feel comfortable investing in Detroit at that time. So I moved to Chicago. I uh, got married, moved to Chicago, my wife. And one of the first things we did was we bought a two, a, a two unit building. So duplex, two unit, two flat, whatever you want to call it. We bought a duplex in Chicago, house hacked it, lived in one unit, rented out the other. And that really got the ball rolling on our real estate investing. Mm, yeah. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, man, that comes up in lots of episodes. It's and, amazing, isn't it? Like that yeah. one book can have such an yeah. impact on so many different people. Yeah, it, it is amazing. And Robert Kiyosaki really uh, kind of caught lightning in the bottle with some very original concepts or if not original, he took concepts that were that already existed and made them very uh, easy to understand and uh, readable and and exciting. And I think you know, he's been a tremendous inspiration to many people. And the purple book is what a lot of people call it. The rich dad, poor dad book uh, is really a classic. And if, if listeners, if you haven't read it, you owe it to yourself, I think, to, 
to read it and understand uh, the value of buying cash flowing assets that uh, that produce income for you. Uh, so yeah, super exciting stuff. Um, Tate, can I say one thing about that book? You betcha. Most people credit it for helping them to start investing in real estate. Uh, but my biggest takeaway actually wasn't that. My biggest takeaway was when he talks about you should work for skills, mm. not for a check. Mm-hmm. And when he talks about that, it really clicked because the logical thing for me to do, I was at you know, a big corporation. They had streamlined the teams and I was actually given an environment to thrive. And I did. I got promoted twice. I was one of the youngest advertising executives in the company. I was the youngest advertising executive in the company. Uh, I had been, you know, quoted in New York Times. And I was I was at a point where I was really accelerating and ascending in my career. And at that time, that's when I made the decision to move to Chicago and go to an agency. And my father, he thought I was crazy. He's like, what are you doing? You've got this great, cushy corporate job. You've got a budget. You got all this other stuff. I had a company car. I mean, it was all this stuff. And I'm going to go work for a smaller agency and just scrap by and kind of start all over in a new city. But it was really the lessons about developing the skills Mm -hmm. that I was focused on. Because the reality is I couldn't really be an entrepreneur um, you know, making cars, right? I wasn't going right. about to, I wasn't about to launch my own car company, you know, when I left GM, right? So that wasn't going to happen. And I didn't really understand how I could take those skills and and use them at the next level. So my thinking was, why don't I go develop my marketing skills with different products and different services? That way I can figure out what that next path actually is for me. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's in that book that I don't, I don't hear anyone really talk about, but I thought it was really compelling to me. And in this world now, you fast forward past, you know, a decade, 12, 15 years later, I think we're seeing that. We now have a gig economy where if you're, you're an accountant and you are a stellar accountant, you don't have to just have your W-2 job. You right. can now take that skill and get on Upwork and go find other businesses. You can write a yeah. ebook. You can launch a podcast. You can do so many other things to monetize that skill that you couldn't do just 10 years ago. Yeah. So now I think that that notion of developing a skill that you can leverage across different platforms, it just it reigns even truer today than it did when Robert wrote that book. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such a great point and and a great highlight that you, you, as you said, not too many people really bring up. And you know, mastering a skill set, number one, it makes you incredibly valuable to uh, you know either a company or to your to your client base if you're an entrepreneur. Uh, number two, studies show that the the happiest people with their the people that are happiest with their work are people that have mastered their their trade, whether or not it was their original passion is kind of unrelated, right? Like, uh, you know, there's this, all this hype about follow your passion and do what you love and, you know, figure it out, figure out what you love and then go do it. And the, you know, studies show that that's not necessarily a correlation with job satisfaction. It's, it's what is a correlation with job satisfaction is mastery level and, and skill level. And, uh, you know, the best way to, to attain those skills is to go do it, go work. Uh, I, you know, I think for somebody that's doing what you want to do or, or what you're doing at a high level and almost look like, like it as a paid internship, right? Like you're doing this job. So, so that, so you can get the skill set. It's not necessarily about the income at that point. It's about the, uh, like I said, the mastery and, and the, uh, the, the learning, right? So yeah, good on you for that, John. Absolutely, yeah. man. I think yeah. you're spot on there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. So that actually kind of leads us into uh, a good segue into what we want to talk about today, which is getting started in apartment investing. And I'd like to hear, John, how, how you made that transition from marketing agency type work uh, to apartment investing and the important transitional points in your career. Well, I think there are a couple of things, right? If you're looking to get started in apartment investing, there are a couple of things that you want to do. First of all, you have to understand what you are good at. Yeah. You know, what's your skill set? What do you well, enjoy so, doing? Yeah. Uh, you know, because you don't want to go in there and just assume you can do it all. And you also don't want to assume you can't do anything. 
So there's something you can do. The beautiful thing about it is it's another business. So if mm-hmm. you have any business skill, those skills typically transfer over into real estate. Again, my background's in marketing. Well, how does that translate into real estate? Well, that comes from being able to source deals. So I can go into marketing to find deals and build relationships. I can go into marketing to raise capital and connect and build a personal brand. I can go into marketing to communicate what the opportunity is, right? I'm creating kind of a a deal memo or deal overview that I'm going to share with investors and kind of create email marketing strategies. We create other things like that that we're going to communicate with potential investors on. So all of those skills are transferable. Maybe you have an accounting background. Well, we got to underwrite all these deals. There's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of projections and forecasting that come into it. So if you understand that modeling, all that plays a role. So regardless of what your background is, if you have some business experience, you can probably find a role for yourself here in the apartment space. Now, for me, uh, when we were getting into it, I say we, meaning my wife and I, we bought that two unit, which I mentioned before. We knew this was working, but we didn't really have a clear vision of what we wanted to be as real estate investors. And I think that's okay. You don't have to come into this saying, I want to buy a thousand apartments. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think it's crazy to just wake up and decide that's what your goal is. It's very arbitrary. I don't know why you would set a number of units you want. Um, I don't know how it changes anything. So instead, I would start with what are you solving for in your lifestyle? My Mm -hmm. main thing that I was solving for was insulating myself from job loss, right? I'm going back to The the people around me I saw get let go with no plan B. I wanted to make sure if I got let go, plan B was just fully activated. That was it. So for me, it was how do I create enough passive income where I'm not solely relying upon this job? That Mm -hmm. was my goal. We started with the two unit. We created a ton of equity. We bought a three unit property that cash flow really well, created more equity. At that point, this is working. So now we go out and buy an eight unit building. I wanted eight units because I wanted a commercial multifamily property. Mm-hmm. I also wanted to experience managing a property manager because one of my thesis was that if this works, then maybe I can scale and partner with other investors. Mm-hmm. But I wanted some experience doing that before I started work with other people. Around the same time, literally a month after I bought that eight unit building, I met the person who became my mentor. And I, as a paid mentor, met them, wasn't really looking for a mentor, but I was very apprehensive about raising money from other people, talking to other people. What I was doing up to this point was just me and my wife's money. If it didn't work out, ah, that sucked. We learned a lesson, right? We thought we were educating ourselves. We thought we knew what we were doing, but if it didn't work out, ah, no, no big deal, right? But if you start working with other people, that burden became really important to me. And because of that, when I met someone who was in this space, who had raised millions of dollars for deals before, who had a pathway, knew how to structure deals, all the questions that I had, I said, awesome, I'm going to work with this person. I want to learn from this individual what they've done, how to do this the right way and scale. And that's exactly what we did. So I say all those things for your listener to step back and just one, what are your goals and objectives? What are you hoping to accomplish? Two, can you find someone who's done that? And if it's a paid mentor, a paid you know partner, whatever, find that person. And I do like paid mentorships as opposed to just uh, unpaid mentors because there's very clear exchange of value. Yeah. Uh, if you are a newer investor and you find a mentor, someone who likes you and takes you under their wing, that can easily become a one-way street. And yeah. that's not really the, the kind of relationship you want to build. So if you can add value to that person, by all means, if you're going to be finding them deals or underwriting deals or doing something where you're truly adding value to that person, great. But if not, you may get either disappointed that this person isn't taking the time to mentor you, maybe the way you anticipate it, or B, that person may just get you know burnt out mentoring you because you're not adding any value to them. I can't tell you how many people will go up to someone ask them to mentor and just take, take, take without yeah. giving anything of value back. So a paid mentorship, it alleviates that, that, you know, the gray waters there. And it just makes it really clear. I am paying you X amount of dollars. I want to get this out of it. And it's a great way for you to grow and scale your business if you're looking to get started. So there's a lot of resources out there. I advise you to uh, continue to push, get as much free education as you can. Um, but free education only takes you so far. And if you want to get a deal, especially in a climate like now, where interest rates are changing, the market's changing every day, 
comps from three months ago are really irrelevant today. You need somebody who is in this market real time who can kind of advise you. So I wouldn't advise you just to take free information, listen to a podcast, read a book, and then run a play based off of that because the market has shifted significantly from the time those pieces were either published or written. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the market's shifted significantly in the last eight, 12 weeks. And yeah, we're recording this on uh, July 11th, 2022. The power of mentorship is something we talk about all the time on the show. It's one of the first action steps that I talk to uh, people that I mentor about. I do some informal um, kind of free consulting on on Zoom meetings and uh, listeners uh, can contact us at our website, investwithgreenlight.com and book an appointment with me there. And so I end up in these coaching situations a lot. And yeah, either a paid coach or paid mentorship is invaluable. I would add the third a third reason why it's not just that the that the mentor might get burnt out or you're not getting as much as you'd like and you're disappointed. It's also that you're putting skin in the game. And when you when you have when you put that, you know, money's nothing but energy, right? So when you put that energy out there, that focus on you know, this is something I'm really putting my heart and soul into and I'm and putting financial resources into, you're going to end up getting so much more out of the coaching because you're going to value it that more. Uh, and that much more rather. So like, again, mentorships are, are invaluable. They're going to save you from making big mistakes. And when you're in a tricky market, like we are, which is kind of how I would describe it, it's especially important to have that kind of guidance and leadership in your business and in your career. Uh, and you know, I did a, I did a paid coaching mastermind, uh, to get us started at green light. And that was, that was my version of a, of mentorship. And, you know, it was with a, uh, a pretty well-known apartment syndicator, a nationally known guy named Corey Peterson, the big kahuna. And uh, he's, he's a, he's a speaker at conferences and an author and a podcast host and has done the business very well. And so uh, it was, it, it gave me a tremendous amount of confidence that I otherwise wouldn't have to go out and start getting deals, doing deals, and underwriting deals, et cetera. And uh, it was really invaluable. I don't, I, I know that we would not be where we are today at seven properties worth $50 million if we hadn't done that program with Corey. Uh, and, you know, amongst other things, I mean, a, a mentor can end up being a partner for you in a deal like. Uh, you know, Corey was willing to let us put him as one of our executive board members in our company profile kit that we send out, which, you know, b- builds credibility with brokers and, and other key people in the business. And that w- was, it, that's leverage, right? Like you are leveraging somebody's net worth, liquidity, and experience, which are the three things it takes to get a loan when you bring in a partner like that. So it's kind of a natural organic shift from going from a mentorship relationship to a, almost a partner relationship, really, uh, when you when you are able to bring in a mentor in, into a deal uh, like that. So we didn't actually end up closing any deals with Corey, but we got so much further ahead of the game uh, by doing that doing that work. And yeah, at the end of the day, you're talking about multi-million dollar deals with multi-million dollar capital raises and huge loans. These are things that you want help with. And uh, you know, you you need the guidance to to really nail that stuff and not make mistakes. Would you agree, John? I agree completely. And I will tell you this: if you are newer in the space, um, this just isn't something to play around with. I mean, I'll, I'll yeah. go back to where I started. You know, it's one thing when you're doing your own deal with your own money. When you are working with other people, their hard-earned money, money that they have exchanged, you know, with their time, they've they've missed other things they could have been done. Well, even if it's just like, hey, I could have been golfing, but maybe they've missed birthdays, maybe they traveled. If you think about it, let's just say someone makes two hundred thousand dollars, and your minimum investment is fifty thousand dollars. If they make two hundred k annually, first of all, I'm not even I'm not even taking out the taxes. Right. So, right. you know, Uncle Sam's getting his cut right away. But let's let's just assume Uncle Sam's not two hundred thousand dollars. You're basically someone's investing three months 
of their their life with you, right? Yeah. Three months that they work, they're investing with you. Yeah. That's a responsibility. And that's assuming yeah. they make 200K. The reality is that person is probably paying about 50% in taxes or so. So you're really getting almost six months worth of their work life that they're investing with you. So that is a significant level of trust. And you owe it to them to do everything you can to look after their investment and make sure you make sound investment decisions on their behalf. I say that there are three C's to attracting capital. And it goes back to what you just said. The first C is confidence. And if you are not confident, it might be because you're not putting in the work because confidence comes from preparation. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking blind hubris. I'm not talking just, you know, want to do it and faking the funk and I'm gonna fake it till I make it. I'm talking about putting in the work. Mm-hmm. Even if you've never done a deal, you can talk to experienced people, you can underwrite deals, you can prepare yourself as if you have, right? Yeah. And that is what I'm talking when I say confidence. It's the ability to look at things, to prepare every day. So when the time is right, you're ready. Confidence. Second C is credibility. It goes to exactly what you were just saying. You may not have the experience, but what experience do you have? Why would someone believe that you could be successful? And I don't mean that in a demeaning way. What I'm saying is if you've had experiences in other realms of business, well, that should carry over. If you were a successful doctor or a successful business person, if you understood how to build teams or you, you know, or master accountant or whatever it is, those skills should parlay. And then you want to build that credibility with other people who are in the space. So who did you build around you? Who are your partners? Who's your mentor, your coach? Who are you know the vendors that you're planning to go on using? But yeah. why would I feel comfortable investing with you? And that credibility is going to come from you, your experiences, but also your team's experience. And that's why it's so important to have mentors and coaches who can help guide that process. And then the last C is connections. You know, the connections, who's in your network. So that, again, go back to your mentor and your coaches, partners, but those are the direct connections. But who else do you know that wants to invest? How do you double that? How do you triple those connections? How do you get introductions to people who are looking for the opportunities that you have to offer? How do you grow your brand, right? You got the podcast, you have other things that you're doing, but how do you expand those connections? And if you can focus on those three C's, the confidence, the credibility, and your connections, you will consistently be able to attract capital for your deals. Yeah. And I would add, like, those are three qualities that are important to winning deals and uh, nurturing broker relationships too. Like that all falls right in line because, you know, you're, you're basically, when you're presenting a deal in a competitive situation, which there are a lot of these days, an on-market deal, you are, uh, you're basically qualifying yourself as a legit buyer that can get the deal done and is going to close. And because you know, brokers, the certainty of close thing is huge for sellers and brokers. So again, you know, getting your first one done is particularly challenging. Michael Blanc calls it the law of the first deal because you don't have the track record necessarily yet. And a lot of times you don't necessarily either have the confidence the uh, the competence or or, or the, the credibility uh, or the connections to get it done. Now you might have two out of the three, uh, but uh, or one out of the three, but uh, it, it it really does take all three. It it made me think of uh, of like all the times that we've presented offers and and are you know trying to win offers and man, you, if you, you got to be on your game and you got to you got to have those three components in place. Like same thing with, with investors, like John said, like it's a game where you are, uh, you're, you're playing with, with high consequence, uh, items in people's capital. And, you know, for us at Greenlight, our residents and our, our investors are what we do everything for, uh, every, everything that we do is every decision we make is with that in mind. And, uh, it, you know, if you don't have that as a priority somewhere in your core values or, or in your mission statement or wh- wherever you, wherever you would document that, I, my opinion is that you're missing something because the, that's your lifeblood it, yep. it, is your investors and your residents that pay, pay your investors essentially, uh, and pay your debt service and everything else. So that's really good stuff. I actually want to dig a little bit into, to raising capital, but 
as far as getting started, uh, yeah, what are your other thoughts on getting started in, in the well, apartment Well, Tate, I'm glad you said that, right? Because if going back to getting started, so with that clarified, right, on the confidence, credibility, and connections, I think you need to look at your, where you're at right now and figure out where do you have gaps and how do you mm. fill in those gaps? And sometimes we're not confident until we do something. You know, it's just a human nature yeah. thing, right? We don't know what yeah. we can do until we do it. So one of the best strategies to getting started as a multifamily apartment investor is to actually invest as a limited partner. And yep. it helps for a multitude of reasons. The first is you're actually going through the steps. And when you're really looking to invest your own hard earned money, you're going to ask way more sophisticated questions or look for different things than when you're just you know, going through the motions, right? When you're Mm-hmm. kind of looking at a deal, but not really sure if you're going to get it. Like you're analyzing this deal way differently when you are truly considering investing 50K, 100K, 200K. You're going to look at that deal. You want to really understand who's the team, what's going on in the market. How did you get these numbers? how did you reach these conclusions? You're going to ask those questions with way more, uh, not just certainty, but way more discernment because you truly want to understand how do we arrive at these conclusions if you're just underwriting a deal and throwing offers out there, well, maybe just looking at spreadsheets, looking at random comps and going. But when you're really starting to look at this, I think you have more discernment. And that's really where you learn. The second reason I think being an LP is a great way to get started is it's going to build your confidence because you will actually have real experience. Yeah. Sure, you're not the general partner. Sure, you didn't find the deal and do all that other stuff. But you've invested in a large apartment deal. And if you are going to raise money at some point, I'd rather you tell me you've got some experience because you've done it. You've done what you're asking me to do or you're offering for me to do, right? If you've invested in a deal, it's a lot easier for you to say, hey, I just invested in this 150 unit apartment complex. Would you have interest in joining me if I found another opportunity like this? Yep. That goes way better than saying, hey, I want to buy apartments. Do you want to invest with me? Mm-hmm. But what experience do you have? None. Do you want to invest with me? no, get away from me. Right. So right. there's, there's that part of it too, right. Where now that dialogue shifts where instead of now approaching someone about investing, you're sure you're just sharing what you're doing. Yep. That's, and that's so much easier just to share what you're doing, to tell people why you're doing what you're doing and invite them to join you on the next time. So I think being an LP is a great way to get started. You know, Tate, you mentioned your, your company, we basically invest in similar types of assets. So reach out to one of us. And that's a great way to get started. So I would say if you're doing small multifamily, if you can house hack, it's a phenomenal strategy. Get started with that if you're buying a two to four unit. In the five plus commercial space, partner with someone, uh, be a limited partner on a deal. Those are great ways to get started. What I would avoid is trying to do it all yourself. This is tough. I spent about a year and a half trying to find my own deal, raise all the capital, build these broker relationships, master a market, And it's just a lot of moving pieces if you want to be effective. And in a very competitive market, it's extremely difficult for a newer investor who doesn't have that credibility and quite frankly, may have some confidence issues on the back end, whether we stayed or not. If you know you're competing against people who've done, you know, 20, 50 deals and they've got $100 million uh, in their portfolio and you're trying to do your first deal, well, you know, you may not have the same level of confidence when talking to a broker that these guys do. So I do think it helps to have other people around you who have that experience, who can help you get comfortable in the situation, because otherwise trying to do it by yourself, you may spend a lot of time really running on the hamster wheel. Yeah. I mean, again, we say this a lot, that this is a team sport. You know, commercial multifamily investment is a team sport. If you're a solopreneur which a lot of house flippers and wholesalers are, uh, you can do those businesses as a solopreneur pretty well. And you know, there's a, I know people that do it very, very well. Uh, it's not the case with multifamily. I don't know anyone, and I and I by that I mean anyone that has done all their projects by themselves or even any of their projects by themselves. There's always some sort of partnership that basically brings the whole package to the deal and and is able to get the deal done. Backing up for a sec, you, you you were talking about my word, this is me paraphrasing, but essentially taking inventory of your strengths and weaknesses and your resources, the haves and haves, the what you have at your fingertips and what you need, right? 
And another way of saying that is to know what your superpower is or, are, you know, superpowers are if you have multiple. And this gets back to developing those skills and, and uh, you know, either marketing or underwriting or uh, broker relations or raising capital. Like you're going to fit somewhere into a business if you have developed a skill set. And the rest of what you need is all available inside of partners and the right partners. Uh, so, you know, when you go to a real estate investor association meeting, just look around the room or meetup group or whatever, look around the room and, and realize that everything you need is in that room. All the capital you need, all the deals you need, uh, all the mentorship you need, it's all in that room. And, uh, it, and that's that's really powerful when you when you can kind of shift your mindset to realizing that another another thing I wrote down is is uh, kind of paraphrasing what you said. Investors, other investors like to see you have skin in the game, and they know that if you have skin in the game, you've vetted the deal in the same way that John said, very carefully, very thoroughly, and uh, and they're they're going to trust you a lot more. And it says a lot. It says it speaks volumes when you've invested. Uh, and it's a, it shifts the conversation, like John said, to uh, to more of a like, this is what I'm doing, and and this is why I'm doing it. And you know, maybe you could consider, maybe you want to consider doing something like this with me, either on the next one or something like that. So, uh, yeah, that's tremendous stuff. And uh, and then just back to being a team sport, like it's it it takes it it takes a a little bit of a team to get this stuff done. So. Uh, speaking of that, do, do you have a, a like a core team, John, that that you work with? Yeah, it's a great question. So we kind of have two verticals in how we operate our business. One is we kind of find and manage our own deals, uh, where we are, you know, lead operators or part of the lead operator team. We do have a strategic partnership there, where we have kind of a, a team member who uh, they have their own business, we have our business, we work together on deals, okay. and that's a great way to partner where you don't have to incur a whole lot of costs because yeah. you build out your own company. Now you've got you know some overhead costs that you've got to figure out, and it can be really expensive starting out. So it's a great way if you could find strategic partners who are willing to work for equity or partner with you with a nice equity split, that's a great way to get started. The yeah. other way we do our business, though, is we do partner with other operators who are in markets that we're not in, or they have you know better access to deals or whatever the case may be. And we partner with them. So we come in, we're general partners on their deals, and we add value to them in various ways. And the key for us goes back to what you just hit on, is we know what value we can bring to the table. So yeah. if you have that skill, if you know how you can bring value to other people, now you know how to leverage that to get equity in deals or to really strengthen what it is you do best. So that's kind of where we focus. But I would say starting out, try to be as lean as possible. But once yeah. you kind of get some momentum, by all means, you want to scale and, and build your teams out. I do have folks who work for me who are, you know, basically dedicated to the business in addition to my strategic partnerships. Uh, and we're looking to scale that out moving forward as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So um, we're we're starting to run out of time, but we we do have some a few more minutes um, just to just to bust in again to to raising capital. You mentioned the three C's: confidence, credibility, and connections. I mean, those are three essential essential items. Mecha like as far as the logistics go, uh, raising capital. Uh, do you have like a you know a, cl a click magnet, landing page, CRM integration, all that stuff going on? All of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. So listeners, that, I mean, this is something that all syndicators, all good syndicators have, uh, which is some sort of value add. And in our case, it's an ebook that you can download about becoming financially independent, retiring early, the fire movement. Uh, and that when somebody downloads that, their contact information goes into our system and, uh, and our CRM. And we market to them, right? And we send them more value add stuff. Uh, we're just looking again to build value, to to give value, and uh, that's really this. That's really the economy these days. It's a value add economy. The currency is 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 kind of intellectual value and inspirational value and educational value. And if you can do that, create that, uh, you know, it's going to go a long, long way because. 
the the opportunity for that investor to invest is kind of inherently in the conversation already when you're when you're adding value around these subjects. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about your uh, your in- integrations and and how you know the the mechanics of of how you raise capital, John. Yeah, I want to take it a little higher level if we can. Um, sure. This is marketing one on one. Okay. Yep. So uh, there's something called a marketing funnel. And a marketing funnel, if you literally picture a funnel, uh, the very top portion of the funnel is awareness. And this is true for any brand, any business, any service. So yep. awareness. And that just means does a customer or client even know that you exist? Yeah. Right. Are they aware that you or this product exists? Once you have awareness, the next phase, the next phase, excuse me, is going to be trial, you know, or I'm sorry, consideration. They know you exist. Will they consider you? Right. Mm -hmm. There are some products I know exist that I would never consider. Tampons. Right. I don't care about Tampax. (laughs) I'm not going to buy any. I don't need them. Right. I'm not in the consideration set. So. There you go, right? Doesn't matter that I know them. I see their commercial. I'm never going to buy them, uh, for me at least. <laughs> so, so you got that right? Consideration. Then you've got trial. Will I try them? Right. Yeah. So let's go back to consideration real quick. Beverages are a great example. So let's say uh, I don't I don't drink pop. You're a Midwest guy, so I'm gonna say pop, right? Pop or soda, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, but let's say there's Pepsi, okay, and there's Coke, and there's Sprite, and there's Mountain Dew. So I'm aware all these brands exist, right? Yeah. Consider them. I don't really drink any pop anymore, but I used to really like Sprite and I like a little bit of Mountain Dew. Got to say that. Um, <laughs> so then trial. Have I tried them all? Yes, I've tried them all. After trial, now you get down into repeat. I tried it. Will I do it again? Right. Yeah. So basically every step in the funnel Someone's making a decision on whether or not this product or service solves the challenges that they face in their life. You know, did I like it? Did it taste good? Was it refreshing? Did it give me energy? Whatever it is, right? It may be if I'm looking for energy, well, maybe I'm not looking at Pepsi or Mountain Dew. Maybe now I'm looking at coffee or five-hour energy, or I'm looking at a Red Bull, right? So now based on that need state, I'm going to pick something different. And then whether or not it works for me, I'm going to say, oh, no, I like this. This worked great. I want to repeat. And then if I repeat, now I can become a loyalist. And every marketing funnel works the same way. So I'll use Nike. Are you aware Nike exists? Most everyone does. Are you aware that Nike makes, let's just say, athletic shoes? Most people are. Would you consider buying a Nike pair of shoes? Well, most people would. Some people will not. Uh, Have you ever bought a pair of Nike shoes, right? Uh, Would you buy another pair of shoes? Are they the only pair of shoes that you would ever buy? We want to get those loyalists, right? But that's also going to be the smallest number of people we talk to who only work with you. And if you think about it from a consumer standpoint, that's exactly what everyone is doing when they come to your website, when they listen to this show, when they're trying to gather information. They don't like, you know, I've got a podcast, I have a blog, I do a bunch of stuff. People aren't just looking for John Kasman, right? What they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out how to solve their financial challenges. Maybe it's their fears, you know, around money that, hey, if I lose my job, how will I, you know, pay for this lifestyle? I had a great stat earlier today. It said, uh, uh, I think 58% of people live uh, check to check and 30% of people making $200,000 or more, I'm sorry, a quarter of a million dollars or more live check to check. So imagine making a quarter of a million dollars living check to check, right? right. That has nothing to do with the level of income, right? It has right. to do with lifestyle creep and so many other things. So what's the fear? Well, the fear is if I lose my job, it's not that I fear for losing my job is that, wow, how am I going to pay for everything? How am I going to take care of my family? If I'm living check to check at this level of income, how do I insulate myself from that? Right. So that's where multifamily investing becomes a solution. And then working with a group like Minds is kind of that platform, right? Just in the same way that, hey, I'm thirsty. Well, guess what? You want something to drink? There's plenty of products to drink. So my job is, well, how do I make it clear that Mountain Dew is going to be the right drink to quench your thirst as opposed to Sprite, right? And, or do you even know Sprite exists? Do I even want to talk about Sprite? Because maybe you don't know that exists and maybe that's just folks. So, so that's where all this stuff comes into play. So yes, you want to have all of that. 
Uh, but I think the most important thing is not to get too caught up. So this is the marketer telling you not to get too caught up in marketing, you know, go figure. Right. Um, the important thing is to figure out who you are uniquely positioned to help and how can you help them? What information do they need to hear from you? And how do you convey that? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if you are looking to help people in your family, friends, you're going to be way better uniquely positioned to help them than I am. Your friends or family don't know me. They know you. Right. If you've had success in other areas and they respect you and they know that you're good with money or you're good with investments or whatever the case may be, then you bring the other opportunities like this is going to go over better than, you know, some guy they just heard on the podcast. Yeah. So that's where you want to build those relationships or even listen to Tate. If you've been listening to the show for five plus episodes, you kind of have a pretty good sense of who Tate is, the way he thinks, the way he talks, the way, you know, he carries himself. So that familiarity is going to go far. And that's really all branding is. Yeah. Branding is just familiarity. If I go pick up a Mountain Dew and it tastes like a Coke, like I'm like, what is this? Because that's not what I was expecting, right? I, I, yeah. I know what to anticipate. The reason McDonald's is the biggest you know, restaurant in the world is because you're going to get the same experience no matter where you are. It doesn't matter. They have a five-star yeah. chef or a one-star chef. They remove the chef from the equation. Yeah. They want a repeatable, predictable experience. And yeah. if you can deliver that, you can be truly successful. And that's all marketing is. That's all this stuff we're talking about, the, the lead magnet, the yeah. email marketing, all this stuff is really just to educate people on what we're doing, what the opportunity is, how it could help them with their challenges or help them with what they were looking to get out of it and positioning you as a person who can provide that value to them. And that's why I go back to my three C's because in order to do all of that, you have to make sure you're doing all the other stuff leading up to it. You got to know what you're talking about. You got to take the time to be confident in, yeah. in underwriting deals. And you got to build a team around you where when you find an opportunity, you're like, hey, you're right. I'm new. But this guy right here, he's got X, Y, Z experience. We're going to partner together. And I, I have full confidence in what we're doing. Yeah. Right. That's the reason that's important, because you're not going to do all this other stuff if you don't really believe in what you're doing. Have yeah. you. I, so I was in market. Right. I will tell you, not all the time that I believe in my product. And those that's the worst. When you're right. marketing a product you don't believe in, a product that doesn't work, a product that's not better than the competition. All right. Well, yeah, you don't work that hard when you know, you're trying to, if you feel like you're, you're pushing something downhill. And yeah. even in those cases, what do we do? We go the other way. We say, hey, it's more affordable, right? It's not as good, but it's more affordable. And yeah. you play to that market, right? Yeah. So there's, there's different ways to, to look at it. But I think the best thing is, get the best, you know, do the best you can do, build the best team around you and have that confidence where now you're starting to get those, those wins, those cases, those case studies, and you're truly helping people. And if you're, if your mindset is about helping people, then you will approach this with the right mentality. If yeah. your mindset is making money, then yes, you may have more trepidation when you're talking to your uncle or talking to someone who's a close friend, because maybe you realize that, Hey, I haven't really put in the work necessary and I'm concerned of what may happen if, if things don't play out as well, I would tell you to focus more on making sure things go well and surrounding yourself with the right people and educating yourself as much as humanly possible so that you are uniquely prepared to take care of those people around you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I just like to observe, I think one of the common themes throughout this episode is really like, know yourself. Like it's just a core quality that really successful entrepreneurs have. They know who they are. They know their values. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses and they're honest with themselves and other people about them. They're authentic. Right. And that is a, whether, you know, at any level of entrepreneurship, that is so key. And it's so key to obviously know your product, know, know your, uh, the value of your product that you're selling. Uh, in this case, we're selling recession resistant cash flowing assets uh, that can, can return really nice, make really nice returns for the investor and, and can change their lives ultimately. Um, but, you know, again, as an entrepreneur do, I, I, I encourage, I'm like, I'm giving a keynote, uh, you know, in, in two days, three days, um, we were talking about offline and, and uh, it's, it's my first big keynote about apartments and apartment investing. And the first thing I'm going to go into is 
is mindset and, and in particular doing the hard work that it takes number one to, uh, to kind of get rid of any limiting beliefs and constraints you have in your mindset, which ultimately are fear responses to probably some either trauma or things that you have from your past that, that you haven't acknowledged or healed yet. And so, so becoming a self advocate and somebody that really digs into the work, whether that's, you know, therapy or coaching or, uh, or, or transformative experiences like yoga or, or, or other, uh, there's a lot of them, right. There's, there's all kinds of transformative, uh, tools that you can use, but getting to the core of who you are is going to be so helpful, uh, to, to you moving forward, because, uh, that's what people want. They want that authenticity. They want to know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, then they can't know who you are. So, Uh, that's just something that kind of keeps coming up for me in this episode. Um, so John, we are out of time. Unfortunately, I, I have, uh, really just, I I guess I have two, two questions for you before we, before we leave, you've seen a lot of syndicators. I know you've vetted a lot of teams, operators. I'm curious what you have observed in the way of qualities that a successful operator has kind of a common quality that you see maybe across the board that, that really good operators have? You know, I would say um, the first has got to be communication. Um, Great communication, clear communication, frequent communication uh, is really clear, particularly if you're going to be working with a group, you want to know what's going on. You want to know what's going on with your, your investment and just clear communication. We can't control everything that happens I think we go into these deals knowing that, you know, there's no guarantee. Yes, these are secured assets, but uh, we're structuring the deal where they're benefiting the LPs first and foremost, but there's no guarantee. So there is some risk in these deals. Uh, We know things happen, but you want to have clear communication on that. So that's one thing that the best operators do is they communicate, they're available, they answer questions, um, they don't hide, you know, they're transparent. And I think that's one thing that I always look for whenever I'm looking to work with an operator. The second thing is that everyone says they're conservative. I have never met an operator who said we're very aggressive in our underwriting. <laughs> um, so I think you you have to decide um, how someone's being conservative. And I think you if you can figure out you know your shorthand for conservative. And a question I like to ask is, hey, where's the risk in this deal? Okay, right. Yeah. What, what's what's the assumption you're making that if it's wrong? you know, there, there might be some risk here. Uh, and if someone doesn't know that, then that concerns me a little bit because there, you are not doing a deal in the last two, three years without having some level of risk, whether it be the yeah. exit cap rate or, yeah. you know, Hey, if we can't bump rents by X percent, or if rent growth isn't there, there's something within your projections where there's a level of risk. And then I want to, you know, the, the good ones are going to tell you how they've mitigated that risk as well. But yeah. those are just a couple of things I like to figure out to know if I'm working with a good operator. Well said. That's good stuff. So last question is any final thoughts for the aspiring investor or for the investor that's done a deal or two that's looking to scale up? What would you, what advice would you give them at this point in their career? Uh, do it right. Do it. Take action um, and focus on the confidence. And what I mean when I say confidence, again, I, I don't mean faking it or just, OK, I'm going to do it because I can do it. No, I, I mean, truly feed that, but also track it. You know, we don't give ourselves enough credit for what we have done. Yeah. Maybe you've only attended meetups up to this point. OK, well, you might have attended 12 meetups. That's that's more than a lot of people do. Maybe you've only listened to podcasts. Well, you might have listened to 30 or 40 hours worth of podcasts. Right. Right. Maybe you've only read books. Well, you might have read six real estate investing books. So if you start tracking what you've actually done, you might impress yourself a little bit and say, oh, wow, I've done that. Like you read my bio. I'm like, who? Who's he talking about? (laughs) I'm like, oh, I I have done those things. Wow, that's crazy. Right. Because we don't take the time to recognize what we've actually done. And once you do that, well, now you're a little bit more confident saying, well, maybe I should take the next level. Maybe I should do my own deal. Or maybe I should do this. Or maybe I should do a 50 unit deal. But you have to give yourself credit for the work you've already put in. And I, I equate it to, you know, the great thing about sports is you get immediate feedback, right? If you go out there, you play a sport, 
you're going to figure out, you know, how good you are, how much work you've done in comparison to other people. Yeah. And we don't necessarily get that in the business world per se right away. So yeah. focus on what you've done and all you're going to get is some feedback. And it might be, you know what, I'm not comfortable yet. Well, you might not be comfortable because you feel like you need to put in more work. Maybe you don't know the market as well as you should. So go take some time to learn the market more. Go take the time to learn what some of these terms more. But just know you're never going to get 100% there. There's yeah. not a point where you pass a test and now you're ready to go be a big time multifamily investor. It don't right. work that way. Yeah. You, you get 80 to 85% there with the knowledge. And then you surround yourself with people who can help you navigate that last 15 to 20%. If you get a question that comes, I still get questions that, you know, are new to me that I'm like, wow, that's a great question. I have no idea what the answer is to that. Let me go look that up. Right. Yeah. I was just talking to an equity partner uh, yesterday or, or this morning and um, they said something to me and I, it was a term I'd never heard before. Like I've been investing with large stuff for six years. I've been investing in real estate for 10 years and it gave the term I had never heard. And I was like, now I got to go look this term up and figure out what it is, right? What, what do they mean when they say that? And yeah. that just happens, you know, but it happened to me in corporate America as well. It'll happen here. Don't, you know, there are no experts, right? There are people who have more experience than you, but just focus on building up your own experience. Surround yourself with great quality people who are willing to help you navigate that landscape. And if you do that, you will be ready to take action, but you just got to take action. Yeah. So well said. I love having guests on that are more eloquent than me. That's it's uh, you, you raise the level of the podcast, John, and I really appreciate it. It's been, this has been a great hour and I feel like some really good wisdom, as my friend Sterling White would say, wisdom bombs and truth nuggets came out of this thing. And, uh, and a lot of great takeaways from the power of mentorship to uh, you know, the three C's those are crucial knowing your superpowers, knowing who you are, uh, knowing your resources and also knowing your needs um, and, you know, power of putting skin in the game, like a lot of really good uh, actionable stuff. So I'm very appreciative. I know our listeners are too. John, thank you so much. Absolutely. Tate. And if I could say this, if you enjoyed this episode one, leave my man Tate and the apartment guys a review. Or oh, a rating. So sweet. Uh, please do that. I mean, it may feel like, it's not that important, but it is. We need that in order to, you know, attract more listeners for these kind of shows. So if you did enjoy this podcast, please leave that rating review. And if you want to learn anything more about us and what we're doing, we host a podcast called Multifamily Insights, as well as have a sample deal package. And this is great whether you are active or passive investor, but you can go to casmancapital.com slash sample deal. And you can check out what a sample deal package looks like. It may spark more questions, right? And maybe you're like, wow, never thought to include that or ask that question. And it'll help you kind of get your mind ready for the deals that you should be pursuing. So check that out if you uh, want to learn more. Yeah, that's that's a super valuable tool, uh, the uh, a sample deal. That's awesome. I often encourage people that are starting raising capital to get a sample deal from a, a live deal from a syndicator that they can go out and, and say, hey, you know, this is a deal I'm working on. If I brought you something like this, is it something you might be interested in? And that's a great conversation starter. And so having something like that at their fingertips is that's a great, great value add. So well, John, congratulations on all your success. I'm I'm sure you're gonna just crush it moving forward. And you know, let me know how I can contribute on my team can contribute to that. And again, appreciate you being on the show. Tate, hey, thank you for having me. And uh tell Chelsea she missed it, like I said. I will. <laughs> uh, but great having you on and uh, or I am sorry, great for me to be on. And yep. we're gonna get you on our show as well. So excited to, to make that happen as well. Yeah, I look forward to that. Awesome. Listeners, thank you for listening to another episode of the Apartment Gurus, formerly the Apartment Guys. We've shifted our focus, bringing Chelsea on as a co-host. So, uh, so thanks for listening to another one and we will see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. Tate and Chelsea are grateful to have you as a loyal listener. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, and review, and share with friends on your Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Also, check out Tate's YouTube channel for videos of many of these episodes and more. Until next time, take massive action steps and rock on.